So our next speaker this morning is Dr. Michael Jaff. Dr. Michael Jaff happens to be the chair of a newly formed institute here at Mass General Hospital, the Heart, Stroke, and Vascular Institute. He's also the chair of our vascular center here. So Mass General is a pretty big place, right? You all know that, I'm sure. And to have three major departments come together under one leader is really quite a significant accomplishment. And it shows how skilled and accomplished one is. But it, when you really think about it, if we bring all the experts together around heart disease, vascular disease, and stroke, this is all, this encompasses the patients that have blood clotting problems. So it's really great to put all the experts together in order to develop the best means possible to take care of patients with these problems and, um, and, and we're delighted because Dr. Jeff loves having time to spend with patients. So um, we're really, I'm really grateful that he, he made time out of his busy administrative schedule with all he has to do with the Institute and is here this morning with us to share what he will tell us about um, treating and preventing blood clots. So please join me in welcoming Michael Jaff. Thank you, Lynn. Good morning, everyone. Everybody wiggling their ankles and squeezing their calves. Yeah, right, I got it. I understand. So uh, just to give you some perspective as a, as a doc, um, I speak a lot to doctors, too. And I quote Dr. Ansel all the time and Dr. Raskob. So for me, this is like a kid in a candy store to be on the same, in the same room in the same panel as them. So I want to just take one second to thank Dr. Ansel again for a really superb presentation. Um, and I, like Dr. Ansel, also love much more speaking to patients than doctors. And I'll give you an example of why that is. When, when we speak to doctors, there's inevitably somebody in the audience who wants to make the speaker look bad. Uh, almost all. Am I right? I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is, right? So I have a friend who um, did some scientific study several years ago and discovered something really important and uh, was asked to travel around the United States to talk about his findings and the impact of his research on healthcare. It got crazy. I mean, he was asked like every week to go two or three times to different cities and travel all over from large metropolitan areas to little small towns to the point where he couldn't manage his schedule. It got too confusing. So he hired someone to uh, do his scheduling for him. So make sure that he was on the right plane, um, got to the right airport, had a hotel room to stay in that night, was able to get back to the airport for the next place. And this went on for weeks. And everything was working perfectly. And every time he would go and he'd give this talk, it'd be exactly the same talk, right? Same 40 slides. And the lights would come up, and there'd be the doctors, and someone always would try and peg him with some difficult question, and he'd handled it perfectly. And it was always the same questions. So about six months into this, uh, my friend gets off the airplane. His, his assistant is there with a car. They're driving to the next venue to give the talk. And uh, the doctor says to the, his colleague, uh, you know, this has been six months, two or three times a week. I am just sick of this. You know, you've been watching me do this now for six months, two or three times a week. I bet you could give the same talk same way I do it. And so the driver goes, yeah, I really think I know this cold. I know exactly when to advance the next slide. I've heard every question answered. And so my friend says, well, let's do something. No one here knows me. <laughs> when we get to the hotel, let's go into the men's room. We'll switch clothing. I'll put on the driver's clothing. You put on my suit. And you give the talk. And I'll just sit in the back and have a beer and relax. The driver goes, that sounds great. I can definitely do this. So they get to the men's room. They switch clothes real fast. In walks the doctor dressed as the driver, goes into the back. And uh, the driver gets up, gets introduced, and gives an absolutely flawless presentation. Every slide perfect. Everything went great. Lights come up. Doctors start asking questions. Everyone that this driver had heard over and over again nailed them all perfectly, except that one doctor who stands up and says, you know, doctor, I read that paper you published in the New England Journal of Medicine really carefully. 
And I think there's a really serious mistake that you made in your statistics that completely invalidates the science. No one had ever asked this question before. Holy moly. Can you imagine? So the driver's up there and he's thinking, if I blow this, I ruin this guy's career, right? I mean, all the work that he's done. So he scratches his chin and he goes, you know, doctor, that question is so easy, I'm going to ask the driver in the back of the audience to answer it. <laughs> so, so that's the reason we're much happier speaking to uh, the public, because you folks are here to learn. You've got experience. Um, and so my job this morning is just to give you a little background on, on how to prevent and treat blood clots. You already heard all about the risk factors. That's the way to prevent them, to know. Knowledge is power in this area, and when you know what the risk factors are, or your neighbors or your neighbor's doctors know the risk factors, they can be very proactive. So that, for example, someone who's got multiple risk factors and has had blood clots in the past, and maybe one copy of that gene for factor V Leiden who's about to fly to Australia, I suspect that Dr. Ansel and I would give you something more than just wear stockings to prevent your risk, right? So it's knowledge that tells it. But I'm also going to talk about um, how to treat these. Now, I don't have the time to go through this in great detail. You're not going to be able to give a lecture about treatment after we're done. But I think you'll get a perspective on the standard treatment and what's coming, what's new, what's exciting in this area, which, frankly, five years ago, we were only able, able to talk about kind of hypothetically. So it's exciting that there are new things that can be used. So you already heard about this. And, and by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, actually take some time to show you some of my patients. Because I think the best way to learn about how this stuff can happen is to see what other people have gone through. Uh, so these are the two big consequences of uh, blood clots. This is what we all worry about. The one on your left is a CAT scan. And it shows, um, this a, shows a big blood clot here. We call this a saddle blood clot because it kind of crosses over to the right and left. So that's that stripe right there. We worry about that. And this is one thing that may not kill you, but it certainly impacts on your quality of life. And that's an ulcer due to chronic leg swelling that can occur after a blood clot. And what this does is it makes you go back to the doctor a lot more often. You have to wear uh, bandages and get them changed all the time. It can be really uncomfortable. And remember that blood clots can affect anyone and everyone at any age, in any walk of life. This just shows you, you don't have to be a scientist, these are the years, this is the expected increased risk of blood clotting over time. This is the real deal, folks. We're not, we're not tailing off. This problem's going to be around. It's going to be around for a long time. And there's a lot of misperceptions out there about blood clots and what they do. How many of you remember Zsa Zsa Gabor, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I certainly remember her. But you want to see, this is a press release that was put out about Zsa Zsa Gabor. And what it says here is that she was admitted to a hospital in Los Angeles for the treatment of swelling in her legs. That's not why she was admitted. And it says here that she had massive blood clots in her legs, which could make her vulnerable to a heart attack. So the perspective here was that Zsa Zsa Gabor was admitted to the hospital for a heart attack. That's not true. Zsa Zsa Gabor had a hip fracture, had her hip fixed, and developed blood clots in her legs and had a pulmonary embolus or a blood clot to the lungs, not a heart attack. As Dr. Ansel said, lots of misperceptions when people call something something that it's not the case of. Think about the healthiest person you could imagine who never in your wildest dreams could end up with a blood clot. How about Serena Williams? Could you imagine? Had a big time blood clot to her lungs. How could she get one? This is all over the press. Even our local mayor, Tom Menino, right? Bunch of medical problems, you all know. He was in the hospital at the Brigham for a long time uh, earlier in the year and last fall. And he had a blood clot that traveled from his leg to his lung. So it doesn't matter how healthy you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter what status you have in the community. This is a non-discriminatory disorder. 